and welcome to the Black Tower. I am a sorcerer, Armand Soul, and today, ladies and gentlemen, friends, brothers and sisters, I'm here with the coolest person, individual I have ever met in my life, Miss Sorcia Renarius. Can you say hello to everybody, Sorcia? Hello there. Thank you so much. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it is. It is more than a pleasure. It is a great honor to have you here. I appreciate you taking time to do this. Uh, so first off, you know, you work with uh, S. Ben Kane uh, from the Ashes Publishing. Yes, I do. I'm happy to say um, I was invited to join the house this, you know, this past year. And, um, you know, I was very honored and I'm, I'm really happy to be there. It's been it's been a good journey so far. And I love I love working with S. Ben Kane. You know, I love his work. I've been a fan of his work for a while. And uh, to be able to work with him like this, um, it's pretty amazing. I bet. I bet. Uh, so, like, like I know, for a matter of fact, uh, just from sitting here talking with you, you've got like a wide range of magical knowledge, you know, uh, you want to talk a little bit about that? Because, I mean, there's some people at home, you know, they have like different practices, but I love introducing new stuff. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I would say, you know, I mean, I would probably, you know, fit under the category of, you know, chaos magician, you know, just because I, I use things from different styles. I mean, I'm very eclectic. I, you know, I consider myself a black magician. Um, and, you know, there's like different areas of magic that I, that I find interesting. And, you know, I just like to delve into them and use what works for me and um, kind of make it my own and then put it out there. Oh, hell yeah. Uh I noticed this a game day and met there. Is that part of your practice? What's what's up with that? It is. This is one that I hand painted. Wow. Um, took me a day to do it. Um, but yeah, I do love Enochian magic. Um, I find the symbol, even without the names, you know, if, um, you know, I left it blank. So I just have like the geometry of the Sigillum here. Um, the geometry uh, definitely changes the feel in a room, wherever it's at. It just, you know, I consider it, you know, like a, a portal, a gateway that it just is here that I keep open all the time. Um, just to have that, that energy flowing through my space. Um, I really enjoy it. You know, I consider like with the Nokian magic, you know, I'm not traditional. I, you know, I, I, I gear it for the left hand path. You know, a lot of people, I think on the left hand path, Ignore Enochian magic, considering it, you know, strictly angel magic, you know, Judeo-Christian. It's totally bullshit. It's totally not. You can incorporate it into any system that you are interested in um, because it tinkers with the mainframe and the underlying mechanics of reality and magic. Um, so I, I like, you know, there's a lot of research, I think, that, you know, um, still to be done on the system. But I... I think that there's a lot there and I'm, you know, I figure things out as I go, but, you know, I do offer um, an Enochian rite, um, you know, um, through From the Ashes Publishing. Um, but, you know, I've been focusing more on the language and the calls uh, more than any other aspect of the system. Wow. Did you have a hard time with the pronunciation and the actual speaking it or do you have like a background in certain languages and sounds and things? Well, you know, it's interesting because people from different parts of the world, when they speak Enochian, you know, they're, it's naturally going to, you know, you're going to probably speak it with whatever accent that you, you know, you're a native speaker of. You know, I'm a native, native speaker of English, but I've studied other languages and I've, I've studied Latin. Um, so, you know, my pronunciation of Enochian, you know, might have a, a Latin, a classical Latin understanding of the words. Um, but I find that it doesn't so much matter the pronunciation as the energy behind it. You know, and when I when I say it, I usually sing it. You know, when I when I work with it, I'm I'm singing the calls rather than speaking the calls because I find that energetically it 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 resonates differently than if you speak it, and it just does something. It shifts something inside of me and then around me, or with anybody listening to it. You know, it definitely can um, open up things in their environment um, and allow currents to kind of pass through. I think it's just there's something about singing it that is unique. I totally get that. Uh, the very first time I took up the Simon Necronomicon, now I've been practicing it for years, uh, like a lot of my viewers know. Uh, but a couple months back, I was sitting there and like I was, uh, I think it was the Saturn gate. Okay. And now Saturn's this stern, serious figure. 
And all of a sudden, you know, I've caught the watcher, caught the fire guys, called the four quarters, all this other stuff. And all of a sudden, I just decide, hey, you know what? I'm going to sing this bad boy. <laughs> and just it just overcame me to sing it. And what was really strange was that, you know, Saturn energies are so heavy. Mm-hmm. Oh, it was like heavy vibrating. It was like uh, being stuck in front of uh, speakers at a concert. Wow. It was that intense with the vibrating of the energy. So I get that. I get that. Did you find that like the effects of the magic, you know, either happened quicker or the effects like were just really more deeply felt in general as a result of singing? Oh, I got to say, I think it brought it to life. It, uh, like in the Bible, it says, uh, sing praises mm-hmm. unto God. Uh, it even says, uh, God abides in the praises of your people. Well, if you take away the whole concept of God and you think of, you know, you, you can say, you know, sing praises under your gods or, you know, the gods abide within your song or your praise. And so I come from like a place, I, I believe in the Thelemic, uh, love is a law, love under will. So I've got this thing of, you know, raising the heart center and using that energy and just abiding in that zone. And then when I start to sing, it is just it is just filled with awe and with beauty and just acceptance of it. I don't care if it's the blackest arcs or if it's the light, fluffy stuff you get, you know, lighter than clouds. Uh, you know, when I when I truly feel something, I'm going to, you know, be in it. And that's an interesting thing you bring up, you know, you know, referencing, you know, the Bible, because, you know, you know, of course, people quote, you know, Genesis, you know, God spoke and there was light. Well, in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew understanding, it was saying. You know, it wasn't necessarily a spoken word, but it was a resonance. It was like a song. So if you if you like look at, you know, and and, and in my own rituals, you know, I will often, you know, break out into spontaneous song. I mean, whether it's, you know, a rite of ascent of self deity, um, you know, I've sang warfare songs and I don't mean like in a language. It's like channeling it through the spirit, you know, like. You know, we were talking earlier, like, you know, in church, you know, sometimes people speak in tongues. Well, you know, I'm not a Christian. I don't go to church anymore. <laughs> but I mean, shame, but, shame, shame. <laughs> the spiritual, yeah, the spiritual uh, principle is sound. You know, it, it bypasses conscious understanding and comes out as a resonance. And so you can, you know, you may not, the words may not have, you know, a language that we would understand in human terms, but in spiritual terms and, you know, that we that we feel and the spirits recognize it has a spiritual power. And so, you know, sing your warfare song, sing your vengeance song, sing your love song, sing your acts of creation and put that out there as a vibration into the universe, into your world. And, you know, that is another level of creation or destruction that we can utilize as magicians. Wow, girl, you got goosebumps on my arms. That's cool. <laughs> Man, I was just kidding about the church thing. I am just, I am anti-religious. I don't buy into anything that has a dogma attached to it. I think that we each have to be like, we have to find our own thing that we're into and Definitely. you know make our own religion out of what it is that we believe and what we practice and what we do. But I had a really weird question for you. Okay, so when you were summoning spirits, conjuring them whatever stirring, shaking, or whatever term people use, uh, did you find that they appeared to you the way you thought they would, or did you, uh, or did you notice or tell if they appeared to you the way they just did? I mean, I don't know how to explain that. No, I, I think I know what you mean. You know, for me, you know, I think that spirits will, like, you know, they transcend human understanding. Like they, but they will speak to us in languages and appear in a form that we can understand or that we might expect. You know, you see all these reports of, you know. In the old grim- grimoires, you see, you know, magicians, you know, summoning a demon and it's, you know, terrifying. Well, a lot of that was from their 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 programming, whether it was Judeo-Christian or whatever. You know, these, these entities will work with the expectations that you come to the table with, you know, whether it's positive or negative. Um, you know, there have been times where, you know, um, I was a little bit surprised, you know, by the form that they took. But it was still, you know, within my realm of understanding. But it's usually, you know, I, I come into ritual, I expecting, I expect respect. If I treat a spirit with respect, I, I expect the same in return. And, you know, I haven't ever been, you know, truly, truly fearful, you know, for my safety in ritual, you know, despite, you know, people warning me that I shouldn't be messing with the forces that I, that I work with. Um, 
because I come into it respectfully. I don't seek to enslave or constrain spirits. I would rather partner with them through free will, through my free will and their free will. And I find that they they generally take a form that, you know, maybe I might have a preconceived notion, but I try to I try to keep an open mind and not limit them by whatever is in my head. I, I can like a take whatever form you choose, but let it be perceivable to me, if that makes sense. No. Um, when I evoke, I use a lot of incense. Incense makes a good base kind of for that spiritual condensation. It kind of gives a focal point um, if I'm doing a physical evocation. Um, but it's always, yeah, it's usually a form that I can perceive, whether it's, you know, outside of me or, or in my head visually. No, what about you? Well, I was going to say, that makes perfect sense. And, I, and I'll answer your question in a minute, but you kind of got me curious on the thought. Have you ever conjured or evoked a spirit to physical manifestation or to where you could see it with your own eyes? Yes. Not like a solid, you know, individual, like there's a man standing in my room. No, not nothing that spectacular. <laughs> but I have had, you know, like... When I say physical evocation and physical manifestation, it's like I expect something to happen in my space that is just like a, a symbol of their presence. So, you know, rapid temperature shifts, pressure and temperature shifts will often occur. It will get really hot or very, very, usually it gets cold. Usually it will get colder in my space, you know, depending on the entity I'm working with. When, when I'm working with, you know, um, you know, angels, it usually is a higher temperature. When I'm working with like really heavy, dark, demonic energies, it's usually a colder temperature for some reason. Um, you know, I'll have candles sputter and spark. You know, I will have incense kind of stay in one spot and, and, and seem to be a little bit more congealed and heavy. To me, that is a successful physical, you know, evocation, you know. But no, I've not had like, you know, it looks like a physical human in the room with me. Nothing quite that visual. It's usually more like little signs that I get, like, you know, the candles, the smoke, that 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 presence of something else in the room with me, like a heaviness, usually a thickness to the air. I appreciate you sharing that because like there are a lot of people that when they hear the word conjured to physical apparition or to physical manifestation, you know, they they're expecting to see this big, huge thing. But the way you described it, that is exactly the kind of experiences one can actually expect from their conjurations. And I'm not saying somebody somewhere on this planet doesn't know how to conjure a spear for reals, for reals, but like, you know, <laughs> but you can bet they're not making videos about it. <laughs> I mean that would be cool. I would I would I would love to fucking see it if, if oh, I you know. would too. And if they did, I would love to see that, you know. That would be pretty cool to experience, you know, um that kind of a spectacular, you know, visual. But, you know, I I trust in magic and I trust in, you know, my evocations and, you know, like for me, like a lot of people, might, you know, I think we all have spiritual gifts and strengths that we can operate in naturally. And I feel like, you know, some people might tend to hear spirits more strongly than see them, or they get emotional, or they just get the gnosis, they get these impressions. And for me, you know, seeing them is not my strongest area, you know, and even like hearing them like a conversation isn't always my strongest area either. Um, there are people that I know that are very, very spiritually gifted, and that they can literally hear very clear sentences in their head. And you know, I would love to do that. And maybe that's a skill that I can work on. Um, I believe we can all work on these skills. But for me, it's more like if when I evoke, I'll have a question either in my head or written down, and then I'll just get the answer. The answer will pop into my mind, or it will be like an emotional impression, or most commonly, it's like it's the gnosis. I'll just get like downloaded with information, you know, spiritual, you know, um, information. And then I'll just, I'll understand a situation and there are times where I have gotten like these huge, vast amounts of information just dumped into my head. And I've had to go back and like reverse engineer, you know, rituals, be like, okay, well, why I have this understanding, but how did I get from point A to point Z? And I've had to go back and reverse engineer this magical alphabet to kind of figure out, okay, why I know that this is the end result, but why, why? And I um, get that result. Yes. And that's kind of how I, that, that is my strong area is like that, the flashes of gnosis, the, the downloads of information, that seems to be how I 
my strong area when I evoke. It's less, you know, visual and less auditory, but those are areas that I know that I can improve in as I, you know, try to like focus it into those areas. But I definitely rely more on, you know, that instant gnosis and then, you know, kind of unboxing it and figuring it out, you know, in the following days after a write. Um, but I think a lot of people feel like their magic doesn't work because it's not, you know, they don't see this, you know, shadowy, fiery figure, boom, appear next to the altar. I mean, no, dude, if you evoke, the spirits come. It's just a matter of perceiving them and trusting that they're there, but just trusting that, well, maybe you're not quite tuned in to that frequency, but as you learn to hone and tune in, you'll be able to see what is right there in front of you. Well, I'm, I'm very lucky. Uh, or blessed, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I got the Claire's down pat. Claire Sentient, Claire Audient, Claire nice. Bush, all that. And I didn't ask for that. Uh, when I was younger, it used to cause me a lot of problems. But as I got older and got into magic, I it just kind of went tit for tat, so to speak. Uh, but there are, there are so many techniques in so many different ways to strengthen certain abilities and certain mentality so that you can develop these things. Uh, but I like exactly the way you put it though, you know, just because you can't doesn't mean it didn't work because it's true. Exactly. exactly. Now, I'll get back to actually answering your question uh, <laughs> about the spirits and things. Okay, so the way I am about this, and, and I've been this way for two decades now, uh, now, way back in the day, I had absolutely no idea how a spirit would show, how they would appear, all this, that, and the other. I didn't have a clue. Sometimes I had good experiences, sometimes bad experiences. But once again, I was blessed or lucky because as I was developing my magical self, uh, I became more truthful. And for some reason, the mastery of myself over my mind, my actions, my emotions, my energies, my, my reactions, all of it. Uh, it started affecting my magic. Uh, so like, like I was saying, I said, like, if you can't be honest with anyone, be honest with yourself. And I think it's because of that mentality that I have that when I summon spirits, when I conjure them, I, I never step into a circle or, you know, working magic. I never think about it one way or another because I know who I am. I know who I am, what I am, what I'm about, what I'm not about. And I don't even have to think about what I'm not. I mean, that's what I was saying. Good. I, I go into it just open-hearted, open-minded. Let's see what happens. And, and for some reason, when the spirits appear, they're very truthful. They're, they're just as open to me as I am to them. And so I think it's kind of like, I think when sometimes when people think of like a mirror world, or they think that these deities or these spirits are all in your head instead of actually real, yeah. I think where they're getting that is because they are affected by our mentality and our state of being. And so when you're at the most pure, precise point of who you are and you're dealing with them, they're going to marry you. They're going to match you. Yeah. That's just my take on it, though. No, I, I think that's very accurate. I agree with that. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, out there might, you know, think that, you know, these are just thought forms, they're just created by man, they are just in our heads, but really, you know, yes, they, they are within, but they are without. And, you know, like I, you know, when I do like, you know, the right that I do, you know, activating and operating the demonic, you know, I, I see, you know, demonic entities as they're, you know, they are separate entities, but you know, I feel like we also have these frequencies within us. It's like we are hardwired with these energies, these these frequencies within us. And to unlock that potential further, we can connect externally um, with these entities. And then it resonates internally and strengthens that bond within and without. And, you know, I feel like we have so much untapped potential you know, and it's just a matter of unlocking those keys within us, like these channels, these gates, these circuits, you know, and there's there's a lot of different ways that, you know, people can do that. Um, but I find that by, you know, working with our spiritual allies that we want to work with, um, you know, just, just working with them does that, you know, and yes, it can be more intentional, like you can set that intention in a magical space to like, hey, I want to grow and evolve and, you know, unlock my own potential. But, you know, you can do that with, um, you know, 
very intentionally like setting that up and say these are the frequencies that I want to operate from. And then you 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 channel their awareness into your life. You respond in many ways like they're living life through you, you through them. It's like you, it's like a spiritual hybridization on some level. Um, and I think that that is like the step that mankind can take if they want to evolve in that way. Um, you know, my own work with Azazel and Will Isle, especially, they've shown me a lot about the human genome. They've shown me a lot about DNA, which, you know, science every day is learning things about DNA and making these big announcements. And it's like, you know, science can just, you know, it's just catching up to spiritual things that, you know, we like a lot of magical people have known for a while, but science is validating more each day. Um, that, that gap is getting shorter and shorter. Um, it's exciting. It's exciting. I bet. Now you bring up a name, Azazel, Azazel, however you pronounce it. Uh, a couple months back, might have been earlier in the year, maybe been last year. I saw a brother of mine, J.D. Temple. He was doing a, uh, he was doing a uh, conjuration or working with Bel with Belial, mm -hmm. and asked if anybody wanted to be included in it. And I was like, yeah, I oh yeah, I do. So like, you know, I went and got my incense together and laid down on the couch and everything. And I have my own personal experience of Belial, but it didn't stop there. Uh, even to this day, I don't even have to light a candle. I can just think on his name. Mm -hmm. And like, as soon as I'm walking to the candle, I've already got the attention. He gave me a very awesome, familiar spirit to work with. And I think sometimes that these greater deities, these greater beings or whatever, I think that when... I think that when people are working with them, sometimes they get confused as to if they're working with that deity or if they're working with a familiar of that deity. Because I've seen, I've noticed that some of their familiars won't correct you if you think that they're that they're that deity. They'll they'll just go right along with it. Yeah. Uh, like like the the familiar of Belial that he uh, that he befriended unto me. Uh, the the very first time I ever made the mistake of thinking he was Belial. Yeah, because the presence, the energy felt so similar. And I noticed that, you know, it didn't correct me. Well, I was halfway through the ride, and I'm like, wait a minute. That is not Belial. That is not the Lord of the Earth and the Flames. There is no way that's Belial. And and all of a sudden, this, this, this familiar is just laughing. And that's something else I'm not used to in the spirit world or spirits laughing. You, you just, you don't think of the really weird nuances of things like that. If you had similar experiences... You know, I I feel like I feel pretty confident, like, you know, if I'm evoking something, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that it's that, that entity, but I feel like there's different sides of them. And I feel like there have been times, particularly with Jen, actually, that I feel like, with you her? know, I've got the Jen, like okay. from like Book of Smoke with Fire, you oh, know, yeah. and another book by S. Van Kane, you know, people should definitely check it out. It's, yes, they there's should. some baneful things in that book. And you know what? I do use that book occasionally. I don't, I don't use it lightly. I don't. You know, I don't have to, but when I am truly wanting to do something nasty and baneful, then I open the book and uh, do some work um, because it's very effective. And those, you know, those entities are no joke and they get the job done. Yes. Um, they're relentless. Yes. And, you know, but I've noticed that with with Jen in particular, it seems like oftentimes like it's like the Jen in question will appear, but then they'll kind of fade back and then push forward some sort of a, a helper, a, a spiritual companion of theirs to kind of do the work as if, you know, not that what, not that they can't be bothered, but because they understand spiritual authority and, um, you know, delegating, yeah. you know, it's like they will delegate these tasks to other spirits to get jobs done. And like, they still, you know, are kind of like the head of it, those spirits answer to them. But I found that oftentimes they will give the task directly to the spirits within their their sphere of influence. Um, so I've had that happen, you know, more with Jen than any other um, entity. Um, you know, I feel like, you know, there are times where it's taken a while, you know, during an invocation. There are times where, you know, I... You know, sometimes you wonder, is this just mental masturbation? Is this just, you know, me with smoke and mirrors and just talking to myself in my room with my candles? I mean, I think we all question that. We all wonder, you know, is this, what the fuck am I doing, you know? But then when you get results, it's like, well, whatever it was, it worked, you know? But, you know, I like to have, 
you know, I think that as magicians, it's good to get to the point where we don't need external validation for our rights and for our invocations. But it is nice to sometimes be reminded that, you know, just by that, those physical shifts, whether it's the temperature, the candles, the condensing of the smoke, you know, it's nice to just sometimes be reminded that they are here in very tangible ways. Because, you know, when you get to a point, like you said with Belial, you know, you don't necessarily need to set up a full evocation. You think him, you, he boom, he's there. He's your, His presence is felt. Um, and that's a good thing. That's actually where we as magicians, I think, would do better to move towards that. So we're not relying on external tools and rituals, you know. But sometimes it's good to be reminded through the tools and rituals just to kind of shift into that space to then connect with that, with that flow. Um, but yeah, it's like, I, I, I know that intuitively, you know, all we really need for magic is our own self, our own mind, our own heart, our own energy. But, you know, I do like, you know, doing it in a ritual just to kind of set that. So, you know, it's like that, it puts me in the mood, you know, it's that set aside time and place, that cathedral and time that you create that sacred space. Yeah, that's a uh... So I named my channel uh, the Black Tower because that is my space. Um, also, after the Tower of Cost, but that's neither here nor there. But that's my that's my magical tower. So you know, and all's welcome within its confines and within its bounds because it's it's boundless. Yeah. And, you know, and there's room for all, but it it has rules to it. Um, I think you brought up something very interesting, and, and I would like to actually kind of like work on it just a little bit, if you don't mind. Yeah, Show sure. Me. Okay, so there comes a time in every practitioner's practice or life or whatever where, you know, it becomes easier to do things without the tools and without all the trappings and without all the movements and actions. But there are a few people who think that the goal of all of it is to totally get away from all the tools. Like, totally. And I, I have no disagreement with, with that particular concept, you know, because to each their own. But I personally, I think that despite whether you outgrow the tools, whether you need them or not, the tools are a good grounding point mm -hmm. uh, for any, uh, any lifelong practitioner. Because, like, I noticed that, you know, I took a hiatus from magic. And I, I had been at a point where I didn't need the tools. I could literally, literally think it and speak the words, and it was perfect. And then I went into my own little magical hibernation. And when I came back out, I had to pick back up the ritual practice of it all, you know, picking it back up. But it helped, it, it re-strengthened, re-armored, so forth and so on. Uh, do you have any advice or any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, that's a really good um, observation and 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 idea because you know well yes all we really need is us we don't necessarily have to have anything external and we can do entire workings in our head and get results absolutely but okay because we also we're not little islands just in the middle of existence because we have collective reality okay and collectively you know for better or for worse you know the group you know the group you know may agree or disagree on on huge things but it's like there's power in these structures in these tools collectively because over hundreds of years of, of people doing magic you know they have determined that okay you know these specific tools okay like depending on the system that you're in but okay if we're talking like ceremonial magic okay some people might like their their circles their triangles their wands their chalices you know different things they may have and because even though okay in and of themselves these are just props. These are just tools. But because the collective unconsciousness has built up this entire power base within and around these things, hey, it could behoove us to use them, even though we know at the end of the day we get it done. We are powerful fucking creatures. But there's also power in, in ritual and tools because of the collective awareness, I think, as well. So, hey, why not use the energy that's there? Why not, you know, um, add that as a layer to your your right and i mean like don't be afraid to like do ritual without it like a lot of people get so focused on the external props that they will they would not dream of doing magic unless they had every single thing physically perfect with their tools you know i feel like that's kind of missing the point of magic it's like that's just focusing too much on the external things you know but if you can understand that hey 
I, I don't have to rely on this, but I enjoy it. I mean, I enjoy a bit of theater and drama. I enjoy creating magical spaces that are very unique and, you know, they have, you know, lots of incense and candles and, you know, sigillums and different, I have different things in different places of my house, you know, for magical workings. And, you know, it just, it adds a layer of magic, of power that I recognize because I've given it value and because collectively, there is history behind it, and I think that we can work with that. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm, the only thing I'm missing is a hip, an umbrella, and some tap dancing shoes, and I could do this uh, singing in the rain. I'm dead there you dead. go. I not care what anybody thinks of me just because it makes me happy, and it's just something funny in my head, you know. And <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, we all have to have a little bit of a goofy side to us, I suppose. <laughs> oh, yeah. Got to keep humor. I think too, a lot of practitioners, they take themselves so seriously. They create an online persona that's very, you know, dark and there twisty and rigid. And it's like, no, I'll, you know, I'll live stream walking down the street, you know, talking to cats. I mean, I'll, I'll do random live streams. I mean, I, I haven't done a lot lately live streaming, but I'll, I'll get back on there pretty soon and do more live streams. But, you know, I, I don't know, like, I like to, you know, show like, I mean, yeah, we all as magicians, especially if you're out here professionally doing things, it's like, yes, we have our, our, our professional author, you know, side that, that we put out here but we also are human like we have other jobs a lot of us we do other things we you know like we're all human man and you know we just are pursuing things that we love you know and maybe doing it more publicly well it's like when i get on here and uh and i'm doing any videos uh you know i'll get on here and say you know uh hello welcome to the black time you host your guide your brother the sorcerer i'm on a soul I'm I'm putting that out there because there there is a seriousness in it and it is something that I hold with high esteem. But then at the same time, I'm chilled and laid back enough that you know, it's it's a it's a teaching experience. It's also a chance to just sit back and show others that you're human, just like them. That way, you know, they don't think all of a sudden they have to become rigid and serious and just oh I don't have a sense of humor. I'm like how far up your butt did that stick go. Yeah. Well, or they think that, you know, that every ritual goes perfect. I mean, I've had rituals go completely like cockeyed, you know, when I was first starting out stories. Also, okay, you know, one of my earliest evocations, one of my first successful evocations was of Lucifer. And, you know, it was pretty intense. Like, there was, you know, a lot of physical things happening in the room that, you know, just really helped to validate that for me. But like, you know, a few weeks later, you know, I, I evoked him like, just a little bit more casually without a purpose. And that's the thing. It's like, you should have a magical goal. Don't just evoke to evoke, you know? It's not like, gee, we're going to, you know, evoke and have a cup of tea. Um, no, there's probably be like a, I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with wanting to bond with your allies spiritually, yeah. but when you're evoking these kinds of, you know, forces, you should probably direct it at a goal, okay? Yeah. And I learned that and, and Lucifer reminded me, I mean, I was, I was up in my, in my magical space and, you know, I had everything laid out and, you know, and I was just like wearing, I was actually wearing, um, like I was in my nighty, Okay. And I mean, some people like, like to wear gowns and wear very, you know, separate magical garb. I mean, I, I, I can evoke in my pajamas. Like I can be really casual or I can be more formal, but you know, I was in my nighty, And so I sitting here evoking Lucifer without really like a set end goal. I just wanted to evoke him and, you know, converse and whatnot. And, you know, all of a sudden I started feeling like really hot. I'm like, oh, this is working great. And then I realized I just about burned my tits off. Okay. I looked down and my fucking nighty had caught because I had about 80 candles lit in around my room. Okay. Because it's Lucifer. It's, you know, this light, this light breaker. So I had every candle in my ritual space lit. It was like, you know, beautiful, light, bright and here my tits are on fire and i look down and my 90s on fire and i didn't get burned okay I, I got a little bit you know warm and pink but no serious burns because i i got oh. it out in time but that was just kind of like okay maybe i should you know evoke a little bit more you know paying attention to my surroundings you know where my candles are in relation to what i'm wearing and maybe i should have a set purpose or i'm gonna burn my tits off and 
that was kind of, you know, it was a reminder. It was funny. I was kind of embarrassed. And I'm like, here I am, you know, thinking I'm this badass black magician. And I'm in my nightgown that is on fire. Set yourself on fire. Set myself on fire. And I'm like, how fitting is that, though, with Lucifer? Because, you know, it's like, yeah, don't. Don't evoke these entities lightly. Maybe show a little more reverence. Maybe not be in your fucking nightgown, you know, or it might burn. It was just, it was one of those things. But again, he also didn't let me get seriously hurt. I mean, that could have been obviously very, very serious. Um, but yeah, I lost the nightgown. But, you know, my skin did not have anything badly burned. Oh. But yeah. Oh my goodness. Uh, I have heard and seen some weird stuff, but that one, that's like, that's at least number one in my book for right now. I'm sure there are other stories out there that are a little bit more, but that one just, that, that took number one spot. I mean, that was just me being careless with candles and long sleeves, but it's like, I think that it was just perfect because it was a Lucifer ritual. And it's like, look, you know, bringing attention to things that need attention to illuminating, you know, this situation on so many levels, but, but, you know, yeah, just that need to like, not, don't do it just casually have a goal, you know, have some things set. Don't just, you know, invite them up for a flaming fucking tea party. Apparently, you know, it needs to be more, more like, direct those forces. Don't just, you know, invite them up for a chat. Um, you know, so that was kind of like a lesson learned, you know, it was, and then I could see the humor. I laughed about it afterwards, but at the time I was like, well, fuck that sucks. But you know, it was, it was kind of a humbling reminder that, okay, Hey, yeah, I probably should take a little bit more care with my rituals and, you know, be aware of my surroundings and, you know, always have a very clear uh, goal in mind. <laughs> That's how you know you're really into it is when you don't realize it's just caught on fire that it takes a little while. That's how you know you're really into that magical mindset. So, you know, that, that may be funny, but at the same time, that's a that's a perfect opportunity to show, you know, just how deep into this you're actually supposed to get with it. But that is that's cool. Uh, I, I got a little bit of a story. Uh, so... So I worked with the Black Book of Azathoth, and I was like, you know, this is pretty cool. You know, I had to change it and twist it around a little bit. And then I'd seen the Book of Smokeless Fire, and I'm like, I don't know when in the world I would ever need to, like, harm people because I was in a good place. But, you know, I want this. And, you know, a few weeks goes by, it finally comes in. Well, meanwhile, I've been having problem at somebody that lived in the area, you know, threatening threatening to do drive-bys and all kinds of weird stuff. And I'm like, dude, what the hell's wrong with you? You need to come to my face and tell me that? Because I'm going to go ahead and take you out with my ball bat. I don't care what you got. But also, at the same time, I didn't want to like, lose my home or, you know, get the popo called out and all this other stuff. And my book had come in, and I'm like, you know, I'm flipping through it, and I'm like, no, oh, no, 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 no. You know, I'm looking for one that might give them dysentery or something, you know. I'm looking for something just kind of so so. Well, I noticed something. They ain't a spirit one in that book that is friendly, nice, like, and in the sense of, you know, lightly get your enemy. Like, no, they straight up get it. Well, anyway, I found one. Oh, and at first I hadn't paid no attention to who it was. I'm just sitting there like, yeah, this is the spirit I want. So I go and I write its name in a little petition on the pieces of paper, and I'm like anointing it and everything, you know, putting my blood on it. And I like getting my getting my uh, charcoal piquette and, and getting the whole thing set up, the triangle, the whole nine yards, and I go out my back, and I'm going to do this. Well, for some reason, my charcoal briquettes would not light for, like, for nothing. And I was like, okay, well, Waylon, this has got to be one of those times when you're not supposed to do this. And I was like, okay, I came inside. All of a sudden, I heard a voice say, you know, why don't you burn my seal? And I'm like, oh, what? You know, because I'm thinking, I've never worked with with gin, especially dangerous gin before. And I'm like sitting there going, eh, is that a good idea? Because this is to like release you. And if you're released and I don't have a direction, what's going to happen? You know, because I'm thinking, you know, it's like a, it's like the lamp. Yeah, you summon it. It could hurt you potentially. It could trick you. But um, imagine it's, it's a, without a lamp. So when you burn the seal, it's like without a lamp in my head. And I'm sitting there like, he goes, no, 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 seriously. Burn my seal, release me to do the work. You have to trust me. And I'm like, 
oh, fuck it. You know, I can't get rid of this problem any other way. So, yeah, you know, I tried the, I tried the rational adulting thing. Now it's time to break out pure badass magician on this guy. And so I go outside and I begin the call. And I go and I burn each one of the strips and everything else. And then I decide at the last minute, I'm like, I just, I re-anoint it with blood. And I'm like, I release this to you. I release you to go, to go work my will, blood and offering. I thank you. Even if this returns to me, thank you. And that's just all I could think to do. And a day went by and I was a bit curious. I hadn't seen the person, didn't think a thing about it. Second day went by and I saw them walk by, but they didn't stop start nothing. And I'm sitting there going, Ooh, what's going on? The third day, I got a call first thing in the morning. Hey, do you know such and such his wife died? And I'm like, oh my God. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, dude, you got the wrong one. And, and like, I didn't see that coming. I didn't see that coming at all. Well, this woman had had stage four cancer. Anyone didn't know that. I had no idea about that because I don't mess with these people. I don't know them. I don't know anything about them. This spirit got her out of the way. It totally got rid of this guy. Like, he lives, like, counties away now. So, like, you know, it's not a thing. And all this other stuff. But it went to that degree wow. to get rid of the problem. And I'm sitting there going, holy crap. And the spirit never came back and haunted me, never bothered me. You know, there was no nothing like this. So a week goes by, and I'm like, yeah, man, that is a badass book. And, you know, like, I go and put it up on my shelf. Now, when I first got this thing, and I've told the story a couple of times, at first I'd be sitting there in my chair, just sitting back, just zenning, and all of a sudden I'd hear, like, what sounded like a hissing whisper. And I'd say, oh, what the hell is that? You know, and I'd go to look around, I could figure it out. And I have, like, a stack of books. And just one day I'm just like, you know, what the hell is doing that? So I'm going, like, going through the books. And all of a sudden, as soon as my eyes lay on it, you know, then it starts getting even louder. I'm like, oh, my God, this book talks. What the hell? I haven't seen this since the Necronomicon. This is crazy. Uh, and so, you know, that right off the bat had my attention that it was the real deal. And then when that worked, but now the funny thing about it is, and most people don't realize this, the energy that you have built up and that you put into something, whether you believe in karma, whether you believe in the law of return, energy sent out has to come back because it had its point of origin it's just a circle it's just the way that goes serpent biting its own tail a week later uh i went through like three or four days my organs were shutting down and i'm like on the couch going what the hell you know because i mean i felt so bad and just and i could literally feel them shutting down and i'm like you know do i need to like redraw that dude seal and like make sure he's not you know coming after me Come to find out the way that it manifested, and people are often confused with manifestation of returns of how this happens. So the bug man had, uh, the uh, maintenance man had made up some really strong poison for the spiders. Oh. Yes, it would have been outside barefooted, this dumbass. Oh. And, and it came in, so, you know, me connecting it, thinking it was the return thing. Uh, and it's not necessarily that that wasn't a return thing, but manifestation of energy can happen in different ways. What are your thoughts on that? Not necessarily. You know, about my that's story. a really interesting point. I mean, because, yeah, you know, like as a black magician, I've done some pretty baneful, baneful magic, you know, um, for myself and on behalf of some clients, you know, because some of my rights are, are pretty dark. Um, but, you know, so, yeah, you know, you worry like, I mean, a lot of people are concerned about, well, could this come back on me or come back, you know? It's like, well, when you understand it as energy, it's not necessarily like, okay, if I do something bad, something bad's gonna happen, but it's like, yeah, energetically, there's still this cycle. So learning how to, you know, transmute energy and understand that, yeah, I'm sending a hell of a lot of energy out here, okay? Um, and when it, you know, if energy does come back, it's going to be able to be filtered and channeled in a way that may not be like, it's transmuted, so it doesn't necessarily have to be destructive, or it could be destructive, like if it's destructive, and it could be like, particularly with a gin, I found that, you know, if you, when you read through that book, I mean, they're pretty baneful, like there's nothing in there that is like kind, yeah, um, there are no gnosis inducing and beneficial, however, 
you can like I find that yes, you can curse an enemy with those entities, but you can also destroy situations and remove obstacles with them. So they are destructive by nature. Um, so give them that outlet. Okay. So I mean, you can use those those same gin that are you know on the surface. Yeah, it's like they do some baneful things to people, but it can also be applied to situations like you know. Um, you know, destroying poverty in your life, destroying, you know, obstacles holding you back. And it might be, it might introduce chaos into your life and it might shake your shit up for a while. Absolutely. However, if you could ride that wave and like harness that chaos, it's the kind of destruction that will clear a path for you. Um, and so, you know, if you're sending out energy, doing baneful things, and if it comes back, it doesn't have to bite you in the ass. It's like that, that energy can do, be transmuted then back into your life in a way that, can you just you just have to kind of learn to to focus it so it's not just like this chaotic energy just being introduced in your space that might manifest in different ways out of your control you might be able to like take the reins on that and say okay i'm putting this out here it's like playing you know uh with a, like a boomerang it's like boom you throw this out here it comes back but it doesn't have to smack you on the head it can absolutely be then directed into this more controlled like a controlled burn a controlled um directed chaos into your life say okay well if this comes back it can annihilate you know enemies obstacles vices um any number of things so then the ultimate end result is actually beneficial and constructive to your life even though the method um might be a little chaotic and destructive the end result ends up benefiting you and so you, that is why i enjoy your 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 input your advice, all this stuff, because that is the difference between a seasoned practitioner and someone who's just starting off is they may not realize that just because something is dangerous or can do this or can do that, it can also be used in a positive manner to remove See. things that need to be gone instead of actual people, because sometimes, sometimes it's just, sometimes it's your emotions need to be under control. Sometimes it's your mind. You know, uh, like in the sense of destroying things, I think of destroying my negative thinking, you know, my self, my self harming uh, emotions, any of those things. Well, it's like electricity, you know, it can be used to uh, elect, you know, the electric chair, it can kill a man or you can fry your toast, you know, cook your breakfast. So or operated the defibrillator. <laughs> you know, defibrillator. Start that hard. It can stop. I'm hard, shock you know? people with them things. It can reset the whole system, but it's like as you, you know, magically as you interact with these currents and these beings, you know, it creates like well used circuits kind of like, okay, if you're working out, you know, your muscles develop, you know, you, you have more muscle mass, you have more energy, you know, um, neurologically, you know, your brain has circuits that are stronger than others you know the more that you use part you know certain parts of your brain you know those those areas are stronger it's kind of like spiritually then as you're tapping into these forces you know you have more access to that current that that energetic current becomes stronger so then you can take more energy you know you can deal with it so like an elect you know an electrical impulse that might you know kill somebody else you know might just you know might just, you know, tickle your toes. I mean, because you have more capacity to to hold that kind of energy and work with it, the more that you do it. Um, you know, and like I said, like I don't I don't use smokeless fire lightly. And it was interesting is I dreamed about that book a couple of times, like three different times. I had very intense, lucid dreams about that book before I even bought it. Um wow. and and so I bought it, you know, and I like I said, you know, I, I've used it for some pretty baneful things. Um you know, but also for some constructive things, you know, through like construction through destruction, like I will, you know, turn these forces loose, like that is their nature is destruction, you know, but direct it, you can direct it in a way that ultimately is beneficial. And, it, you know, yeah, you can direct them at a person to destroy people that, you know, you choose to do that with, or you can, you know, you can aim it at, and it's like a gun, you can aim it at a human or at a tree. I mean, you can, you can, it's just a matter of directing it. You just have to give them an outlet to work or it becomes very destructive in your own life. Um, it has a potential to do that. Um, you know, but there's, there's a lot more possibilities for working with those kinds of entities than, you know, than people realize, you know, um, there's, there's many layers, but I think, you know, just, just spending time with it, you know, or any entity, not just, you know, that book, but that's, you know, that's a definitely like, 
that's a good one um, that I do recommend to everybody <laughs> that is interested in, you know, painful things. Um, pretty hardcore. Check that one out. Um, but I think, you know, just the more that we work with these spirits, the more that we can work with these spirits, the, the stronger that link is. And like you said, you just have that, you know, like with Belial Azalel, you have that that link. You don't have to go into like a full ritual. You know, it just becomes more intuitive. Um, it changes our circuitry on some level. Um, you know, I've, I've played around with uh, like, I don't know if you've ever heard of rapid eye therapy. Have you ever heard of rapid eye therapy? I can't say that I have. Uh, I forget the lady. I forget the lady's name who did it. I could, I could, um, I could uh, send you the info. Just you know, because it's interesting. But it's like, okay, so you know, your your eyeballs and your brain are like directly connected to the you know right. the optic nerve. Okay, so this lady like developed a therapy, and it was actually to help with uh, trauma, healing trauma, like PTSD. Um, and this was developed, I think, actually in the 80s, early 90s, but in the 80s originally. Um, and it would take, you know, she would take like a like a, a stick, like a wand that had a light, a little diode at the end. And she would move it in very specific ways in front of your eyes. I mean, not like a hypnotist, but, you know, in very specific patterns. And while you were, your eyes were tracking this device, you know, you would be, you know, repeating certain phrases. So there was like some neuro, um, neuro linguistic programming that went along with it, but it literally could rewire parts of the brain. Okay. And wow. so it was like a way to like, uh, you know, heal emotional trauma and, and your reactions to it. Now, when I, you know, I find that interesting and I've seen it work, you know, I've, I've had friends and family that have tried, at, um, tried rapid eye therapy, um, and they, they had good success. Um, you know, as magicians, you know, I think of sigils the same way. I've tried that with sigils. Like I've, you know, I've, I've looked at the sigil and I, and I would like let my eyes trace the lines of the sigil. And it's like, I could feel something happening in my head with my eyes. It's just like this really weird sensation and, you know, might want to try it sometime, but it, it's like, there's, there could be a link between like the symbols and the circuits in our brain. Like, you know, how could you like rewire parts of your brain using sigils by actually letting your eyes trace the sigils you know i'm curious to know like i would love to have access to all of these you know high-tech scientific instruments you know like an MR, you know mri stuff i'd love to do like a brain scan where if people were looking at sigils what part of the brain is firing up and if you could light that up that could be its own sigil that actual brain map of electrical activity could be, be could be a sigil um i'm fascinated by it by like yeah. sigils. Couldn't you just imagine science mixed with metaphysics? Yes. Holy crap at the stuff we could imagine. Yeah. Um, I can that's you know, and that's a direction that I want to take it. You know, I'm really fascinated by, you know, merging magic and medicine, magic and you know, different sciences. Um I think I think they could work really well together. They don't have to be at odds. Um, but I'm fascinated by, you know, by sigils, by NLP, by you know, alternative holistic therapies, um, kind of merging them and, and seeing how they can complement each other. Um, but I'm really, really fascinated, you know, by um, like biochemistry, by DNA, how we can tinker with that, because I think that that is, you know, another evolutionary leap forward, if we can unlock that, because we have so much DNA that is, you know, supposedly junk DNA. Um, but nature doesn't like, doesn't code for junk, you know, because otherwise, why would we have evolved? You know, nature does not evolve things that have no use. Okay. So it's just a matter of learning what, what it's there for. I mean, my, my theory is that, okay, this is like our potential DNA. These are, are like, you can shut genes on and off, you know? So learning how to turn the genes on that are dormant, you know, what, what could they do? How could we evolve? How could that change us physically? How could that change us mentally? You know, higher intelligence, you know, um, accessing, you know, many layers of perception um, on different levels, I think, like, I think that's what it's there for. I mean, again, I'm sure a scientist would say, well, prove it. You have to have a way to prove it and measure it. Well, yeah, I'm still working on that part. But, um, you know, I would love to, you know, get hold of a lab where I could, you know, tinker with some of these high tech lab tools and um, play around with it, you know, in the context of, of magic and science and, and see what comes up. 
Well, I I appreciate your 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 input, your advice. I mean, all this you know is awesome, and you know I think it's interesting that, for example, uh, you're into black magic. You know, you work in dark arts and things. Do you do you want to touch base or talk just a little bit on the things that you do in your regular life? Yeah, I'm um, sure. I. You know, I, I love being a black magician. You know, I do, you know, I'm out here publicly, you know, um, for hire doing magic, you know, and, but it infuses every aspect of my life. But, you know, I, you know, I like to also, yeah, spend time, you know, with friends and family. I like to, you know, do work that, you know, you know, pays the bills and whatnot too. I mean, I, I can do, I've done magic, you know, as my sole source of income and it's, you know, while it's, you know, it's amazing, it's fun, you know, it's still nice to kind of have other, you know, multiple sources of income. I think that it's smart for those of us out here to like, you know, do magic if we want to for hire, but also have, you know, other ways, you know, to help pay bills, you know, and, um, you know, you know, currently to do that, you know, I'm doing, I've, I've had a lot of different kinds of jobs in my life. I have a lot of things that interest me. Um, you know, I used to be an EMT. I've worked in the medical field before, you know, most currently I'm, I'm doing caregiving and, um, it's interesting and challenging because I see it as like, you know, people who have certain conditions might be labeled as crazy or, you know, mentally disabled. And, you know, while they may have trouble functioning in society sometimes or taking care of themselves, like, I think sometimes they might be like perceiving different layers of reality or they might be living in an entirely different level of reality than what, say, you or I might experience. And they're responding to that and it might be manifesting in some pretty extreme behavior sometimes. Um, so, you know, it's it's never dull. I mean, every day is kind of different with what I do. Um, but, you know, I enjoy it. And it's, you know, it's something that I can do to kind of, you know, supplement income and, you know, do a good service. But, you know, what I really love, though, is is the magic. I enjoy my days off so I can kind of focus on, you know, my projects and books and other things I have going on. But I think, you know, like, I like to keep it real. I like to do things that, you know, for myself, but also you know, that can like be of service to other people too. Well, you know, I, I appreciate you coming on here with me and I appreciate you sharing so much about yourself and so much about what you do. You know, I, I think that for whoever watches this, I honestly think that, you know, not necessarily whether it'll be entertaining or boring or any of that other stuff. I think it's actually filled with sustaining energy type subjects. So, I just want to say thank you so much for making this possible. Well, thank you for inviting me. You know, I'm honored and, you know, I love connecting. And this is, you know, this is what I, this gives me a lot of hope, you know, being able to connect with people. And, you know, this is the kind of community that, you know, I really want to build. And that I think you want to build too. You know, you're out here, you know, I see you on Facebook. I see you out here and, you know, you're connecting with people. You're interacting with people, you know, um, so many people just, you know, they're so isolated. And I think that, you know, especially on the left-hand path, you know, we're all very individual. We all have our own paths and our own interests. And that's because we're so rigid and serious. They can be very rigid and serious. They got to stick up their butt or they just, you know, they don't want to connect because they're just like, you know, fuck people, people suck. Well, you know, yeah, some people do, but you know what? We have a lot of good people out here and a lot of people, you know, we can help each other. People can help each other and there is strength in numbers. And even though we all might have our own approach to magic, you know, some people might want to be public. Some people may never consider talking publicly about what they do because, you know, they, maybe it's not safe for them to do so, you know, socially or with their work. You know, there's a lot of reasons why people don't come forward and that's that's fine. But I mean, those of us that want to be out here, you know, we're out here, we put ourselves out here. We want to build community where, you know, people can help each other. You know, we can advocate for each other. We can, you know, sometimes work together, do magic together. I mean, that's the kind of community that I want to build. And, you know, and, and that's what the Black Tower and that's what I do. That's what it's all about. It's about it's a place where other sorcerers, sorceresses can come together. Be a community, share knowledge without, you know, fear or worry about who's who's the grand Pumbaa because it leave your ego at the door, as I say, you know, because when we're amongst each other, we are brethren. We are brothers yeah. and sisters. We are kin, you know, and go ahead. No, 
know, and then, you know, and that's why, you know, another, like, why, you know, I love that, you know, and your channel and, you know, I'm with From the Ashes Publishing, you know, I love that they, you know, they have that sense of brotherhood. They want to kind of, you know, put that out there because there's, there's other groups. There's a lot of groups that I respect, you know, other publishing houses, other places that, you know, like I have a lot of respect for their work and their members, you know, but it's like, you don't always see a lot of cohesiveness in some of them. And I like being able to, you know, work with the people that I do and know that, hey, at any given time, day or night, I know I could call them and be like hey shit hit the fan like can we help each other out and any of us know that we can do that and i don't know that that's the case in some of these other groups i mean i may not be involved in, with other groups so i may not i mean they might have their own dynamic but you know that's one thing that i really appreciate about our group is that you know we can we can network we can help each other and you know i love that you know you're out here doing what you're doing and you know you're, okay. you're building connections and networking and you know like you seem like the kind of person that, you know, if somebody came to you, like you would give them the shirt off your back and you would like, you would go to Great Lakes to help them if they were sincere and came, you know, just honestly and like, hey, this is what, what's going on. You know, you would like, you'd probably help them out. And that's, that's what I want to see out here. So that's, that's awesome that's what you're doing. Exactly the way I am. The thing is, over the years, I've had to learn how to spot the sneaky little ones that would take you for everything you have. So you know, but at the same time, I don't allow that to stop me for who I am. And I've noticed that your mug's the same way. Despite the way anything could be, you still put yourself out there. You're still there. You're in the community. And we are blessed and enriched to have you here. Well, thank you very much. I, you know, I love being here. I love, I love, you know, connecting with people that, you know, that are authentic, that, you know, can be real. We can sit down, have coffee have a conversation and you know and put it and out a here. lion king coffee cup I I love it. mine's like a flowery cup very girly but yeah but it's so pretty thank you but it has has coffee and then I, I got my rock star you know that is one of my oh yeah one of my vices is my my caffeine but you know i do love it <laughs> but you know it's yeah it's been really fun you know i love being able to chat we should definitely we should definitely do this again sometime oh it would definitely be awesome uh right now i am connecting with a few others i'm trying to get a few more people in here awesome. uh oh yeah but without further ado uh to all of you out there peace blessings and power till next time thank you guys